This is Pamela Salem, and you're listening to the Sirens of Audio. On the 21st of February 2024, the world lost Pamela Salem, an actress known for so many roles in film, television and theatre. She starred opposite Sean Connery in two films, including a James Bond film playing Miss Moneypenny. On television, she appeared in programs such as The Professionals, EastEnders, The Oneidan Line, The Tripods, Blake Seven, All Creatures Great and Small, Magnum P.I., and The West Wing. For us Doctor Who fans, however, Pamela is best remembered for her three Doctor Who appearances, with Tom Baker's fourth Doctor as the voice of Zoanon in The Face of Evil, and Toos in The Robots of Death, and with Sylvester McCoy's seventh Doctor as Rachel Jensen in Remembrance of the Daleks. Pamela had since returned to those roles for Big Finish in audio series such as Countermeasures and The Robots. So in 2021, Philip and I had the privilege of speaking with her about those audio roles as well as her life and career. We recently took time to reflect back on that interview and what it meant to us personally. It's always a great joy to speak to the guests we speak to. It's been a, a, an amazing privilege of doing this podcast. Is the people willing to come on? And, and Pamela is someone that I have, have had a crush on since I was quite young. Uh, when I first started watching Doctor Who when I was about 10, uh, one of the first episodes I saw was Robots of Death, and I loved Toos. I just thought she was the most amazing character. The scene where I thought she was strangled and dead, I was just devastated by. I was emotionally, uh, you know, I was just devastated. Um, and I always realized that this was just such an amazing character, and I fell in love with the actress, and I loved that voice. And I sort of followed her career. And so from that moment on, I kept seeing her in more and more things. And so I was really keen to talk to her, having had this sort of big crush on her. There's a, there's a few people we've spoken to that I've had crushes on. Um, and of course, Pamela was a great joy. She was living in America at the time. And when I tracked her down, she was very keen to talk to us, like really enthusiastic. And I was just so overjoyed by that. And so we set up the times, organized to talk to her. And then when we came on air, we missed her by over an hour because... I'd got my times wrong. I thought she was in LA. She was actually in Florida. There's hours apart. And so we'd I think we got up. Didn't we get up at three? We got up at three o'clock in the morning or something to do yeah, this too. Yeah. We did. We got up at th- we got up at three AM in the morning to do this interview. <laughs> and then we're sitting there talking, you know, talking to each other and trying to work it out. And then we worked out we were in the wrong place because she actually emailed saying, you know, I went and she'd waited for us. And and yet she was so positive. And I felt so bad about it. And yet when I contacted her and explained how I'd got it wrong, she was more than willing to just set it up again for the next day, which was just a 5 a.m. morning for us that day, I think. It was a much later morning. Um, but she she wasn't she didn't grumble about it. And just talking to her, just the joy she had, the joy of life. Um, there'd been a big disaster in Florida at the time. Was, um, you may remember there's a block of flats had come down. Lots of people had been crushed and died. And we were able to discuss that for a while. So, but just, she was just so positive and loving life. And she wasn't well, but nevertheless, she was just so keen to talk to us. I was born in India. And I expect you know that. And then I, I, um, I, I'm quite a mixture of things, but maybe, maybe the mixture came out helpful for, 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 for a voice. I don't know. I had lots of things. When I was at drama school, I remember having... I was at Central and having all sorts of things put straight because I would say things like off, you must take it off. I remember things like that, which were very colonial. <laughs> Got to stop that, you know. But um, I, I think also what's lovely is if you do, if you're lucky enough to get work that you can use your voice for, you get more and more practice at doing it. You know, so it's just, something I love doing. I've always loved reading and audio and all those sort of things, which is why I love working for Big Finish now. In fact, uh, we have discovered we have Indian in us, which I am delighted to know. I always knew it, but <laughs> now we've got it you know, pr- proved with these mad genes things. Um, and then I went to England in, in good old colonial fashion. They would send you to school 
boarding school in England, very young, in the, in, under the impression that you didn't learn anything in the country you were in. And actually, it's madness because, of course, um, you know, people have a he wonderful respect for education in India. Um, but anyway, so I was sent to like eight. No, I, I was seven. I was seven when I went to boarding school, which is quite young. But um, they don't do that now. And also, you didn't you didn't see your parents a lot because it was terribly expensive to travel. Whereas now, you you find people come back, as opposed for half terms and uh, all sorts of things like that. You know, so um, it makes you independent. But it, it's a strange thing. My godson went when he was five, I think. Was he six? You know, it just was taken in one stride like that. Um, and then then that was England. And so you always see India as, as home. And my sister, my darling sister, was still back in India. So, um, and in fact, went a bit later than I went because my father said at that point, why do we have to go so young? Let us stay longer here. So I had quite a gap before she came out as well. Um, but then it was lovely because then there were two of us there, you know. And also you learn to make friends and things, you know, because you've got, you've got, to, do, you've got to meet somebody when you're that little, you know, to school. I've spoken in the past about my Doctor Who collection off air on my beta cassettes and the Robots of Death was number one. So it's potentially the Doctor Who episode that I've seen the most because that was my number one. And of course, Pamela starred in that as one of the, uh, one of the guest cast, one of the guest cast who survived, one of the few who survived in that. Um, so yeah, I remember her from that. And then of course, not a couple of years later, she appeared in Remembrance of the Daleks. So once again, I knew her face very well. And she just kind of, she was the kind of person that just kind of oozed elegance. She had such an elegance about her that was always there. I always loved the the um, the non-Broccoli James Bond movie, Never Say Never Again, where uh, she plays Miss Moneypenny. So I always remember from that too. And, uh, you know, Blake Seven, she was in that. So she popped up in a few different things that I was really obsessed with over the years. But, yeah, that, that time we chatted with her, she had that same elegance that just came through. As you said, she wasn't well. Um, we're able to show some of the, the footage uh, from our chat that day on this occasion. Um, so that uh, that would be nice to share as well. Um so yeah, it it was a privilege to be able to to speak to her. She's such a a, a vivid memory of my Doctor Who childhood. Well, I, because I had worked with him before in the first great film, I think he suggested me to, to be some penny, which was nice. He was so easygoing and funny and humorous, and I, I mean, I just we spent an awful lot of time in, in first great film, Robbie, laughing. And um, when we came to do the bond, I think I really noticed how he paid attention. I know he's older. I know he had a different reputation when he was younger, being a real, I believe he's got fisted up, got into things like that. But when he was older, he, he fought on behalf of people who couldn't fight in the set. You know, he, he would... He even said that. He said, I now can say things that I, I couldn't say when I was young, so I can say it for other people. Um, he, he was, there was a big battle going on when we were doing uh, Never Say Never Again because it was mixed up with, um, you know, the broccoli breakup. And um, I think a, a lot of that, he, he was very much always, I don't know, he was, to me, he was always on the side of the, the little ones, us, you know. He, he wasn't a starry person who just kept himself at stars. He was absolutely one of us. And the other thing I always, <laughs> I loved about him was he had a tupo and a little thin piece of tupo. And he would pull it off when the scene was over, march around in the hotel, walk out without it. You know, he still looked absolutely marvellous, of course. And that was such a lesson for people who are trying to give themselves an image because if you keep doing that, you get so used to him both ways. It really isn't a shock to see him without, you know, the hair. 
it, it shows huge confidence. You can just do that, march around with your hair in your hand. I think that that was quite interesting to me to see how. Yes, I, I love doing Never Say Never Again. I think one of the things that really, as I said, I had a, I had a big crush on her when I was 10. I was a couple of years older. And um, also, my crush grew a bit more when I saw her in The Professionals. So I'm not sure if many people remember The Professionals. My father was loved the show, and it was probably totally inappropriate for me. But I remember watching that. And she appeared in two episodes. Um, one where she's just very powerful at the beginning. He sort of runs away and is found dead and naked on the beach. Um, but another one she plays, she actually ends up being the, the main love uh, love for Bodhi. And it's a really powerful episode. Those two together are just electric on screen. Their chemistry is amazing. And at the very end, she gives her life to save him, which is, you know, I guess, a trope now that happens all the time. But, you know, but back when I was younger, it was still fairly new. And once again, her performance was just so powerful. And so I just remember time and time again just being blown away by her. Of course, you have Blake Seven that that's, I just love doing as well. Um, yeah, it's just a very powerful actress. And then even more recently on The West Wing. So she was playing the Prime Minister of England in The West Wing in, in a couple of episodes. And every time her voice comes on, it just, just melts my heart. So having her come back to Big Finish, and you know, firstly, all the countermeasure stories, which are absolutely brilliant. So if you've not, if you've not listened to countermeasures, get them, because they are all just amazing. And it's the six, there's a whole series of 60s episodes first, and it really evokes the feel of the 60s. And then they bring them forward to the 70s. And that's an even funnier period. And they change the music. They change the style. Um, but even again, that's really amazing stuff. And then when she gets to come back to robots and playing twos, it really just you know, brought, that, brought that full circle. So even towards the end of her life, and she wasn't well, but she was still just loving the fans, loving life, and just doing stuff, which was just wonderful. And she expressed that she really loved doing Big Finish too. So whenever she came over to England, she would she would uh, book in some time for Big Finish. And yeah, it was a shame because they uh, David Richardson brought both her and David Collings in uh, to the robots. And of course, David Collings passed away first uh, and then she was unwell. So that, that story was kind of not resolved, but it was really good to have them in that series, that's for sure. And Countermeasures, I'll just echo your sentiments too. I think Countermeasures is one of the best spin-offs that Big Finish has done, for sure. Mm. Well, once again, we reached out to a few people that she'd worked with in the past, and they were more than willing to jump on board and join us. And so we're looking forward to sharing with you some of their thoughts and their memories of Pamela as well. So the first person we spoke to was Louise Jameson, and uh, we asked her about her memories of Pamela, uh, whether she'd recognised any of the work she did uh, in the past and uh, how she felt about it. I'm ashamed to say I didn't I didn't know of her. Um, you know, I was quite new to the profession myself when I first worked with her, which was 77. So, um, no, I, I didn't know of her. I, I kind of knew that voice, that amazing voice, soft and seductive and just a slight accent on it. Um uh, but I didn't know. I didn't know her work before that. I thought she was a bit like a goddess because she was so um, calm and uh, present. I wouldn't have used though. I wouldn't have used that word back in the seventies. But that that whole ability to be in the now. She seemed to have that, and she seemed to kind of bring out the best in everybody you know because she was so um gracious all the time she sat with a very straight spine she listened very carefully to what people had to say that's my experience of her anyway that you that, that, that there was a kind of respect in the room that was absent when she wasn't there there was a, i mean not to say that she wasn't huge fun as well i mean i can see her now you roaring with laughter throwing her head back um but there was definitely an aura about her that projected calm sophie aldred played doctor who companion ace when she co-starred with pamela salem in remembrance of the daleks the first time i was ever aware of pam salem was in the read-through for remembrance of the daleks I'd never heard of her before. To my shame, I'd never seen anything she'd done. But I quickly realised that this was a 
a real like the real deal uh act actress yeah actress karen gledhill also starred in remembrance of the daleks as one of the guest cast next to pamela salem did she know of any of her previous work i didn't which i mean i suppose the reason I didn't is that I, I was born in 1960, so I was very busy just kind of growing up in the 60s and 70s and uh, not really watching the sort of movies and stuff that Pamela was in. So, and even Doctor Who. So, I, you know, I was watching Doctor Who probably in the 60s, but then not so much in 19 age years and things. So I hadn't, she hadn't come up on my radar really at all. I was too busy being a teenager. <laughs> Director Ken Bentley worked with Pamela on her big finish appearances in both Countermeasures and The Robots. Yes, I was, I'm a huge fan of The West Wing. So I, I, I knew of Pamela for being the prime minister and being a brilliant prime minister and, and showing us in this country what a great prime minister should be when we've had um, um, so many bad prime ministers for s over so many decades now. Um, so, so that's the that's the work I was um, most familiar with. Um, like, like, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 it won't surprise anybody. Um, uh, I don't think who's listening to know that I didn't realise she was in Doctor Who. Uh, the, the, when she was in Doctor Who, I was um, um, I was at art school, so I was quite busy doing um, other things. Uh, Mostly just going out drinking. So sadly, I I missed um, I, I missed uh, Pamela's time in the TV series, uh, but did catch up with it subsequently. Um, and and then of course I I I, I um, and I knew her as as um, Money Penny too because I'm a bit of a Bond fan, um, including those spin-offs we um, many fans don't really want to talk about or acknowledge as being canon. So um, so I knew about those roles, but um, it, it was. What was fascinating about meeting and working with um, Pamela is just how much she's done because she's one of those actors you suddenly realise has um, a appeared in pretty much everything over the years. It was a, it was a the, it was amazing not just the amount of work she had done but the breadth of work from from some fantastic Hollywood movies, um, some classic TV series, but also a lot of um, cult TV as well. Louise Jameson recalls working on The Robots of Death and her initial impressions of Pamela Salem on set. It was a pretty amazing cast. And I think uh, if you look at that casting, the, the, it was way ahead of its time with its inclusivity. And also the fact that back in the day, we, we, we could have the robots in the room rehearsing with us. Um, nowadays, you'd only, because their face is covered, they wouldn't bother to pay, well, they don't pay for rehearsal full stop, but they certainly wouldn't have any robots in the room. They'd have an ASM reading in, you know. She was kind of standout. Russell was in that cast, wasn't he? Russell Hunter. He was, he kind of, his personality <laughs> was in the room. Um, so he, I wouldn't say dominated because Tom Tom was always you know top dog, but um, until K nine arrived, <laughs> <laughs> see what I did there. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, she certainly made an impact. Um, like I say, the graciousness and the and the calm, really lovely to have her energy in the room, which was you know normally quite testosterone. Did Tom get on with her? Yes, everybody got on with her. Nobody didn't, that, that I know of. Um, maybe because she was such a brilliant listener. Everybody likes to be listened to, don't they? Um, but the humour was definitely there. I mean, the, the head dresses for that particular... <laughs> I don't know what they were thinking, because she had a kind of um, cox comb, didn't she, on she her did. head? Yeah. And I remember them all really laughing at, uh, uh, about how they how they appeared there. I mean, I know they wanted to sort of exude decadence, didn't they? So it's sort of these completely unnecessary um, extended pieces of jewellery, really, with these mad headdresses. But we they did make us laugh at the time. Really made us laugh. Yeah, we didn't realise that they 
exactly that here. But what was it was one of the first things that did uh, they called it optical blue in those you know with the eyes of the robots that they could impose things on the eyes like I think it's something green now it's called probably not used at all now but um, you could put stuff across it optical blue and you know the blue would wipe out whatever was standing behind it. So it was, a, it was a fantastic thing for the robot's eyes to go around. So we were all absolutely intrigued by that. Plus the design, I think, of that one was so good. It was very, well, you can see even with the robots, it, it was so stylish, it had, didn't it? It had a look of its own. It looked terribly expensive. I don't know if it was terribly expensive, no, but it, was, um, it looked wonderful a bunch of actors doing it and lovely playing all these robots and the danger and the costumes were wonderful. And we had the BBC electricians had a strike going on. I probably told the story and you've heard this, but they had a, an overtime strike going on and um, they had, they would just finish at 10. They wouldn't give us any extra time. And we were right at the end of that show up in the gantries, Louise and I, in this room, you know, with the robots coming in, the terror. We had to finish it by 10. And we were running up and back and down the gantry to do another take. I mean, hugely, um, got to get in, got to get in, and then, pop, blackout. Um, somebody had to come up to us with a flashlight and get us down from up there, the two of us down to the ground in the dark. I, you, I don't know if you could do that now. Sophie Aldred. Well, I saw this elegant, sophisticated, beautiful woman and I thought, wow, gosh, that's somebody, it's the kind of person who I probably will never be. <laughs> but I could really appreciate her. Do you, know what, do you know who she reminded me of most of all is Lady Penelope from Thunderbirds. I just thought, oh, that's the, that's the walking, talking Lady Penelope that is. She was absolutely gorgeous to work with um she was um she wasn't you know she wasn't a great extrovert um but, and she took everything very professionally seriously but she was also a good laugh as well so there was this group of us there was Simon Williams Pam Salem and Karen Gledhill and then there was Sylvan and me and whenever we got together we just couldn't stop laughing really because Simon Williams was very naughty and irreverent and any seriousness that Pamela might have had was sort of swept away on the wake of naughty Simon Williams um, and we just it, it felt like a real unit that the three of them who were meant to be working together they really did feel that they like that they were uh, they would have been like that and you know I, I loved um the character that the, uh, the characters of um, uh, that Pam was playing and Karen was playing were very sort of like dismissive. Of, oh, the men, you know, ugh, like that. And I mean, that it was a bit like that in real life. There was Sylvester and and uh, and and Simon trying to sort of uh, entertain everybody and show off, and we were like, oh, you know. So it was sort of a bit a bit like that. And um, but she, yeah, she was just delightful. Uh, always always kind and generous and um because of course don't forget it was my first story as the assistant so she was so experienced compared with with me and so I was watching her um to learn from these other actors and sh and it was great to see her her poise and the way that she um uh you know she she was very um very well, professional, I think, is the way to put it, but not sort of coldly professional, warmly, kindly professional. Karen Gledhill. In the read through for Doctor Who, so the first day that we um, that we all gathered together, and I was completely overwhelmed by, um, well, mainly Simon actually, because he I was on my radar <laughs> and, and from upstairs downstairs, and uh, he first came over and said, "Hello, I'm Simon Williams." And I was going. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know. Um, but then Pam also was introducing herself to everybody. And she was just incredibly, that was when I, you know, I first met her on that day. And she was just incredibly 
kind and not at all um, superior. So, you know, just just on a level. Ken Bentley. When I first met Pamela in the studio, um, the first for the first uh, Council Measures recording we did with Big Finish, and um, uh, and she uh, she was from the minute she first walked in and the first time I met her to the um, uh, to the last recording we did, just one of the nicest people in the world. Considering the career she had and the the kind of people she would worked with and the work she had done. She was the most unassuming person. She would just sit on the sofa with you and have a chat. She'd ask about you. She wanted to know about your pets. Um, she she was she was just one of the she was a a really lovely person. I can't. There's there's no other way to describe Pamela as uh, other than being just one of the nicest people you could ever hope to meet. The story I remember is off set, which is she and I. Well, I used to visit an uh, a now dead. A uh, famous uh, actor called Leslie Grantham before he was famous. I, I used to do some prison visiting, and um, it, it had been drawn to my attention that Leslie was a good actor, and and um, would I please write to him? And then I visited, and we we became very good friends. And I helped him knock his audition speeches into shape, and then he got into drama school, and then the rest is history. He did the rest completely on his own back so one Christmas I was going to visit him poor Leslie is going to be all on his own and as I was coming out Pamela was walking in with a fully decorated Christmas tree <laughs> literally carrying it lights and everything ready to plug in how she got it past the guards she'd have used that amazing beauty and charm and calm attentiveness I suspect but they let her in I mean I couldn't even get you know a packet of cigarettes in there without stuffing them down my bra and uh <laughs> and she arrived with a fully decorated Christmas tree for Leslie Grantham I didn't even know he was being visited by other people I felt less sorry for him after that I thought well if Pam's on his case on his side as well um that's amazing and I, I can't remember if that happened before or after I worked with her, but it was definitely around the same time. Well, you've met Pamela, so you know what she's like, but she's just an incredibly unassuming person. Um, she's She was very uh, at one with herself and therefore no neurosis about her acting or her you know performances in any way. She was completely happy with what she was doing. And because of that, she was able to be completely containing of everybody else as well. Um, so we just played for eight weeks on Doctor Who. We just played being a couple of scientists who were obviously very smart. And Pamela and I, neither of us understood really anything that, that we were saying or doing. And uh, But we just pretended that we did. So that's kind of how we got on. And we just, um, I was very obsessed with um because I hadn't done any telly really to speak of before that so I was very obsessed with continuity I didn't kind of realize that there was somebody whose job it was to keep an eye on that sort of thing so I had charts color-coded charts with um what I was wearing in each scene and exactly kind of when I was leaving the room and when I was coming into the room and what the time difference was between each thing and Pamela thought this was hilarious because I mean she obviously knew um, that it was completely unnecessary but for me it was very necessary <laughs> and we had one scene in a cafe where there was food involved and stuff like that and that really worried me because I didn't you know it's like if you're you know you watch people not often any these days but smoking in in television scenes and it's really important that the cigarette doesn't go from that to that in one kind of second I think that's why they usually put them out after one or two puffs because it it's uh, too complicated to do the continuity on it so Pam was really um yeah she was very amused by that and also by the fact that I did try and understand the story better than she did so but she always had really complicated things to say <laughs> so but I don't think we realized you know when we did Doctor Who it was just it was for me obviously it was exciting because it was a it, it was my first big television role and just that was exciting. And meeting Sophie was great because we're good friends and have remained good friends. And, you know, we just, but 
I don't think we realized it was just an, in some ways it was just another job and we had I had no idea at all of, of what would be the implications down the line from doing that and I think we just you know we weren't sort of sit, go spending every day saying oh this is Doctor Who we're in Doctor Who it was just kind of we're doing a telly job together and this is really really good fun there was never a cross or dull moment during the whole time that was about eight weeks we were shooting that in in the days when you actually got rehearsal had Pamela mentioned working on Doctor Who before at all at that stage? Or not? Yes, I mean, I was aware that she had done, uh, I think, one before that. Um, but again, she wasn't sort of, she was just in the moment. She didn't bother about that particularly. You know, when we were doing that job, we were doing that job. And I was her junior and I was her junior. And it sort of, it it fitted in very well. I was supposed to be, um, We you know, we were this, we were working in the same um area it, 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 it's slightly it's even now I'm slightly not sure kind of what kind of scientists we really were um that's become a bit clearer during countermeasures but not at that time I mean I think we just did you know, actors are very good at pretending and doing what they're told and that's kind of what we were doing we were just pretending and doing what we were told and in the rehearsals with all those scenes where the windows come in and everything there's one in the classroom and all the windows come in and stuff and we were all just in the <laughs> just mucking about I mean really it was like kids we were like children in a playground um and that's what it felt like and she was she was as much a child in the playground as anybody else <laughs> um lot lot of laughter partly because Simon is very naughty and he makes everybody laugh heard that before so, um, yeah. <laughs> then it was right. 24 years before you came back to countermeasures. Mm -hmm. um, had you had any contact with Pamela in between? That yes, I had. I had, um, mainly through Doctor Who sort of fandom, actually. There was a, she was over, she didn't live in, in England, so it was very difficult to keep in close contact with her. Um, but we met, she came over and we, somebody did a big interview with us um, for I can't remember what magazine. I've probably got it somewhere. Um, and we met in a restaurant and we had the most fantastic time. I mean, I, the, the problem when Pam, when Pam and I get together or got together, it was almost impossible for anybody interviewing us to ask any questions because <laughs> we'd just be talking. Um, the same happens with Soph, actually. It, it, we, we just start talking and the other person is just left kind of... Just sitting there, really thinking, okay, this is easy. Um, so we that was one occasion where we met and we had a really, really nice time. Um, and I, I, I'm pretty sure there was another time that she came over before that, but because she didn't live here, it was actually quite difficult to keep contact with her. Um, we did another big interview together, but that was much later. That was during countermeasures like this, where we were... Um, Across, across the Atlantic, actually, in that in that instance, but yeah. So what was it like when you got to work with her again? Oh, gosh, it was fantastic. It was fantastic. What was absolutely amazing is that we both kind of looked at each other and said, you haven't changed at all. And of course, we had changed quite a bit, but it just didn't feel like we had at all. And she always used to say to me, you've not, you, you just haven't changed at all since then. And of course, I mean, I have loads. It's now nearly, I don't know how many years it is, 35 years since we did Doctor mm. Who so you know we get older um but we just it was it was unbelievable clicking back into that relationship and also because it was so much more developed um in countermeasures from Doctor Who you know in the Doctor Who I think Ben actually did a fantastic job with remembrance he had a lot of characters to deal with and he sort of set things up really nicely and then there was a book which I didn't discover until many years later, but I now have a copy of. And it quite, it's quite, I think, Alison and Rachel are quite further developed in that book. And Julian appears, which, of course, he wasn't in Remembrance. Um, so by the time we got to countermeasures and they they were sort of, they'd filled out our background and our characters a lot more than um, they had in the Doctor Who. Because, you know, there were three parallel pairs in Remembrance. There, were, there was the Doctor and Ace. There was... Rachel and Alison, and then there was the group captain and whatever the name of the character that Dursley played was. Dursley was it Mike? played Mike. Was it Mike? Yes. Mike, Mike Smith. Yeah. 
So the which and he's mentioned in countermeasures at some point as well, or in in assassination games. I can't remember. Anyway, there are these three parallel uh, pairings of a, an older, more experienced professional, and then the younger Heen, um, and uh, well, in Dursley's case, rather serious actually uh, characters. So it, the grouping was slightly different, and and. Um, of course, the young, the three younger people, we all became quite good buddies. I saw Dursley a lot after Doctor Who, and uh, and so there was a sort of and Pamela and Simon knew each other anyway. I think from previous incarnations, and Sylvester is just Sylvester, um, and then there were all these other very well known actors, but much older than me. I mean, they're, they're all dead now. I think Michael Sheard and. Um, Sewell, but uh, oh gosh, I can't remember their names. I can picture them, but I can't remember all their names. But they, uh, yeah, the gold, the guy who played the headmaster, and um, that's Michael Sheard. Yeah, Michael Sheard, I do remember, but I can't remember. And then there was George Sewell. Was it George Sewell who was in it? Who played the sort of um, undertaker type person or something? I know I can't remember. Sure. It's a while since I've watched it. Uh, but they, so they were quite eminent, and Harry, somebody as well. I'm now remembering. Uh, George was uh, like the he was like the double agent type guy. He, yeah, uh, and then there was somebody yeah. called Harry, somebody who played another person in it, and they were all quite well known actors. So they they were playing these. So it was all a little bit kind of overwhelming. Sophie at that point wasn't so well known because she was quite early on in her time as Ace as well. Um, and Dursley it was before he really. I mean, he was sort of known already, but you know, so. It was a funny old kind of mixture. But when we got to countermeasures, it was just me and Sam and Pamela. And then they introduced Hugh, which kind of lent a whole new sort of dynamic to it. But we were just so pleased to see each other. I can't, I have thanked David a hundred times for putting on countermeasures. It's, it was life changing, I think, for, well, certainly for me and Pam, because neither of us were really doing, I'd been bringing up children. She'd moved to America. She'd doing bits, some acting in America, but she was, mainly there because of Michael, I think, who who was working there and wanted to be there. And just for us to be doing something together after that amount of time was so unexpected. Um and it was it was we just looked forward to it so much. Got really excited when they kept doing more. You know, they did one lot and then there was more and then there was more and then there was more. And then now sadly there won't be any more, but I think that's that it had come to an end anyway. So as charming as she is as a person, um, she she is to work with too. She was um, she used to um, roar with laughter at all the scientific and technical jargon um, she had to um, uh, uh, deliver in the um, in the series, and uh, because she didn't understand a word of it. But um, and, and this is what I liked about her the most: she she would openly admit to not understanding a word of it. Uh, but would and would roar with laughter and then totally nail it and deliver it. She was such a pro. She knew that her, uh, her she, she as a, uh, she, um, Pamela as a person didn't need to understand it. She just needed to deliver a convincing performance so that we knew that Professor Jensen did. And she, she just did it every time. She was brilliant. She was just, it, it, she was, she was so much fun, really giggly, responsive to everybody else's sense of humor as well. Um, and just just made the recording every recording a joy. We asked our guests what they were grateful for, and what they had learned from their association with Pamela Salem. I think, to be honest, it's the it's the it's the joy she had when we were working with Pamela. She was you could see that she was struggling health wise. She was brilliant. She was totally on top of everything she was doing, but physically some things were a little bit difficult, and we knew that. And we were we would always try and help and 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 sort of set the studio up accordingly and make sure we we sort of um, helped her. Uh, um, gave her any help she needed. Not that she never needed any. She was amazing. She was a force of nature, um, but. But d despite all the stuff she was struggling with, she was still the sort of first in, the last out, um, and, and and more attentive to everybody else's needs than than we ever could be to to hers. She was she was such a um, um, Hugh who uh, Hugh Ross who we recorded with in the in the same series. Um, uh, I've had lots of conversations with him about about sort of um, uh, uh, people and human nature over the years. 
And um, he introduced me to a phrase which I think is a brilliant phrase, which is um, people are um, people are either radiators or drains. And um, and sometimes when we've been talking about sort of difficult people we've met, um, they're they're a sort of drain on your energy. It's a brilliant metaphor. And um, Pamela was just the most amazing radiator of of beautiful energy. She really was. Mm. And so finally, what are you grateful for? Meeting her, uh, having, uh, I can't tell you, we, you know, we're very, we're very lucky at Big Finish. We meet, we meet and work with a lot of, uh, a lot of really nice people, but it's a, um, uh, you know, life, life can be a, a sort of struggle for all of us for, for many different reasons. And it can be, it can be a burden sometimes, and it can be quite difficult and we can make, we can easily make the wrong choices in the moment as to how we how we deal with the situation or or deal with the people around us and i i get i'm enormously grateful that i had the opportunity to meet and work with pamela the number of times that i did because whatever she was going through in her life um she was a a benchmark for how we should all behave as as people and how we should treat the people around us. So I learned a lot from Pamela about how to be kind, how to be patient. I suppose it's our very, from, from in relation to me, it's very intimate conversations about our, well, my in my family, she was very interested in my family and our dogs. And we spent a lot of time talking about our dogs. And I used to take my dog to the studio because I was very attached to her. And it was just something we, a, a love that we quite genuinely had in common and shared. And we used to talk a lot about our dogs together. Um, and just... I don't know, because we didn't see each other, we saw each other, it was always a bit of time, even with countermeasures, there was always a year in between. There was just a, lo a lot of catching up to do and a lot of, uh, but just she was always so interested in in what other people were doing and so unselfish in the way that she uh, expressed herself. She was quite an, an unusual, well, you've met her, but she was quite an unusual person. And a fantastic actress. I think I re I think I underestimated her. Not underestimated. I think I just didn't appreciate how good she was until I started listening to countermeasures. And and I, I just was really struck. And I've I've been listening to them again since she died. Actually, I've started listening to it all again because I wanted to hear her voice. And and just she was really really good in that. <laughs> <laughs> really good and especially as I know that she didn't know what she was talking about and you kind of think how you know she'd say Karen I really don't understand this plot and in fact they'd all come to me and say what's going on here because I'd be the one who is actually trying to work it out and talking to the writers and you know talking to John Dorney who understood everything um and to David who understood most things and and just trying to work out which sometimes wasn't great because quite often they don't really make sense so you know, I wanted to know, but I wanted to know because that's kind of who I am. And um, and I was just so struck by how she'd she'd talk. She has these amazingly complex scientific explanations for things, and then she'd come out of the booth and just laugh because she had no idea what she's talking about. <laughs> it's very funny, very very funny. I think I learnt from her how to be gracious, how to be generous. Um, to have somebody that in, in your life, like Pamela, you, you don't often meet people like her. And just her, uh, she had no side, no edge. Uh, she was sort of just, it, it's some it, things you want to, you know, that you want to take from her, you kind of want to be like her <laughs> and, and to be as, genuinely open and uh just kind and thoughtful and interested and engaged and optimistic as she was it, it's when you meet somebody like that you think you, you you do question your own cynicism and 
well, just other things that sort of happen in life. But she she was really, really good person to be with from that point of view. And I will certainly carry that with me and do, I think, carry it with me because she was quite unique in that respect. It's unusual, especially with actors, to find people who are, you know, she was so com she was comfortable with herself. And that's a really, really nice quality. And because uh, actors can be very neurotic, as I'm sure you've discovered. <laughs> and she never was. She never was. Um, and she was also just gentle, kind and funny. So those are the things that I would, uh, when I think of her, you know, I just think she's somebody who you want to, want to absorb and carry with you. I am most grateful for having been able to learn from her, um, her poise, her quiet, um, yeah, as I said before, her, well, her quiet, warm professionalism um, and just the sort of um, the love and the generosity that she also exuded, I think. Um, and I am, it, it's a really good question because I am grateful for having known her. I'm very pissed off she's not here. Really pissed off that I didn't have more time with her. I guess everybody said that to you. Um, yes, I'm grateful. I'm, I'm, I think she taught me how to... I think she taught me how to handle a tricky situation with dignity. Because, uh, you know, it's no, it's no secret that, that, that Tom and I didn't have the best of relationships. But there's always a way to, there's always a way to communicate that isn't uh, confronting. And she had that in bucket load. And the other iconic partly played around that time was in Blake 7, which I guess in some part was this you know, role you walked in and walked out of, but it's become quite a significant role in terms of Cara. Well, do you remember much about your time in Blake 7? I remember having hysterics with Brian Blessed. He could, I could not keep from laughing when I was with him. There's a couple of actors that are like that. And <laughs> we just... He just knew how to make us laugh. And um, we had to come back and finish a scene. Also, I think it was something to do with the strike. But we, we had to come back and do the, a, a scene where I was given them some sort of pill in, in the story. I, I was just, I was still thinking that. And Ryan, apart from the fact that it literally, we laughed and we wept and we had to be so careful because he put the makeup on again. He's a terribly funny man. He also had the most wonderful, interesting stories to tell because you probably know them, but even he experienced going up the St. Everest and up with somebody who saw the Yeti or had the Yeti walking around the tent all night long with the strange smell and footsteps. And he had photographs of uh, a, a yeti that had been captured in the forest, and then he had some wonderful things of the Loch Ness Monster, which I was completely convinced about by the time I finished seeing what he had. So it, it was a delight working with him, that's what I remember, more than we had to come back for this particular um, scene. Um, out of the blue, against the wall, you know, just to finish off the scene somewhere. And again, I had to just be terribly careful not to laugh, make this scene be serious, because you could just say something and crack us up. <laughs> so we don't think that. Need, need some people like that around at the moment. I like to have a laugh. Well, I, was, I was surprised looking through YouTube, there's actually been a, um, a, comp, a hit of the, those scenes with you and Lewis Collins together, and a romantic song put over in slow motion, and a fan's actually turned it into this big romance number. <laughs> Search up on YouTube. It's <laughs> oh, funny. Oh gosh. Remembering Pamela Salem were Louise Jameson, Sophie Aldred, Karen Gledhill, Ken Bentley, and the hosts of the Sirens of Audio, Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. <laughs>